57talk.com. Gary Cubetta back with you again, taping from Scottsdale, Arizona, and it's my pleasure to introduce legendary wrestler and manager, Skandor Akbar. Skandor, pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you for having me, Gary. Skandor, you were very involved with the days of world-class championship wrestling from Texas, Fritz Von Erich, the Von Erich boys. When did you first get involved with Fritz? Well, of course, uh, getting involved with Fritz was in the 60s. And I started in 1962, and in uh, 1966, uh, when Fritz was, uh, uh, so to speak, he and Ed McLemore had broken away from the Houston office, and uh, I worked uh, you know, several uh, matches with these guys down here on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And uh, that was in 1966. Then uh, I had a couple of other tenures with them in the early 70s. And bear in mind, that was NWA at that time. And world class, uh, of course, uh, his inception was in the early 80s with a name. Were you with world class from day one? No, I was not. I was not. Uh, however, uh, I was fortunate to uh, to uh, get into world class uh, after everything was really going good. And uh, I might add that uh, this this organization reached epic proportions as far as drawing, and and uh, it was just literally on fire. Uh, as uh, people that watched world class wrestling, I mean, it was addictive to them, and uh, the ratings just jumped completely out. And uh, uh, it was uh, in the early '80s when I came here. Now I want to add that uh, I was working along with Mid South at that time. And I started working both organizations. So I was hopping around with the uh, the great organization, Devastation Incorporated, and of course it was a lucrative area for the uh, a lucrative, lucrative era, I should say, for myself and everybody that, that was in world class and associated with that organization. Skandor, what was it about world class wrestling when you arrived? Because you'd worked with Fritz before, you'd worked in a lot of other mm. territories. What was special about it? Well. <laughs> What I think is it was uh, they it was a little different uh, the atmosphere as far as that goes. You know, Dallas and Fort Worth and uh, Texas was always a good territory. But uh, I think uh, when the kids came along, uh, it was kind of like uh, uh, they reached out a little bit further, and and uh, the younger people uh, started the uh, the uh, classic viewing, and uh, and you know, and, and I always uh, it was like uh, they were they were the franchise. Guys, when things got going good, you know, and and uh, uh, it was at the point where if uh, one Von Erich would miss uh, due to whatever, uh, you would stick another Von Erich in the show, and uh, nobody uh, nobody would object to that because they were the franchise. And yeah. uh, you know, I had the big dragons with me, and uh, you know, and uh, they were supposedly the dragon slayers. So uh, it was, uh, like I said, it was uh, unique in its own way, and. and and uh, it's hard to uh, to uh, fathom that any other organization, maybe Mid South, would have the equality of the uh, the uh, drawing, and the, and the people still remember. And uh, I uh, each day that uh, I get around this area, people recognize me, and they always ask me about world class and when the wrestling business is going to get back like it used to be. So I'm not getting off on a tangent. I hope not. But uh, this is the way that uh, world class was. It was an organization where uh, if somebody came in and, and it was on fire, all you would do is just reap the rewards. And uh, there was, uh, uh, everybody was over, so to speak. And uh, Who'd you and, who'd you bring in when you first came in? Do you when remember? I first came in, I brought Kamala with me. Uh, actually, Bundy was with me uh, for a while. And uh, I had uh, uh, Gene Lewis, who was Cousin Lewis for a while. And uh, he had a, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, was a, it was a little different moniker there. They're a little bit different, and uh, and uh, but Kamala was the first big gun that I had, and then uh, the rest of it. Kamala, you know, but, Kamala at that time was money in the bank, right? Yes, yes, we were doing tremendous over at Mid South. Uh, so how'd Fritz approach you? Hey, come on in, Scandor, bring Kamala. Yeah, well, here's the thing, Ken Mantell who uh, I had done a lot with over in uh, Mid-South, and even before it was Mid-South, going back to the NWA days, before the big name change and the split. Uh, and Kenny had taken over 
as the uh, booker here in Dallas. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity for me. And, and uh, so uh, it, we, we set up between the two territories. And uh, if, if, if I would make an interview for New Orleans, so to speak, like that, and I couldn't be there with Kamala, of course, Friday would be there. But, you know, it was a lucrative payday for me in both spots, maybe if I was in Fort Worth. So uh, Kamala was the uh, first big gun, and then we followed suit. You know, I had Killer Khan. I had the missing link. I had the Super D's, who were was an excellent tag team match. Who, who were they? They were the Irwin brothers, the, the late and great Scott Irwin. God rest his soul. He was he was a, a very close friend of mine, and Bill Irwin. How would you compare Scott Irwin, let's say, to a Bruiser Brody? Uh, they were a long, uh, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of the wrestlers in those days had that certain breed about them. They they uh, uh, you know the the tenacity. And, of course, what everybody wanted to do was to get over. So when you speak of Brody and Scott Irwin, they would always get over. Like I say, you know, tenacity. They were uh, they were competitors. and uh, A lot of people don't remember Scott Irwin because he passed early. But he was, yes, he did. He yes, was he did. Huge. Heartbreaking. Yes. He was huge. He was in great shape. And he could work. Yes, he could. Yeah. And I, he was the first one that I'd seen with the, uh, you know, the superplex off of the ropes and everything. And the way he did that was just phenomenal. And when Scott passed, it was a sad day, and I still uh, stay in contact with Bill Irwin. When, and, oh, yes, ahead. sir, go ahead. When you first came into world class, were they selling out reunion, or was it still on the way up? They were basically selling out by the time I got there. Okay. I got there in about, uh, I, I'm going to say late 82 or mid-82, mid and then uh, the 82, 83, 84, 85 was just mind-boggling. It just went on and on. Were you there, be- you were there a little bit after the free birds and the von Erichs had started their yes thing. yes it, you know the groundwork had been laid and and uh, uh everything was on its way up and they did switch bookers you know the late gary hart was there for a while and then ken mantell came in and then uh everything else was just uh, uh like i said you know you had a different package on the card not only the von Erichs, you had chris adams who had come into the territory uh uh Iceman king parsons uh i'm talking about the uh the baby faces now and uh uh, and then you had the the big dragons like my boys, and then the the birds. You know, interestingly, you know, uh, I'd like to add this. Uh, there was sometimes that they would put a six man on with the free bird devastation, and we made them big baby face. Hey, we did that in Dallas and Fort Worth, and they would turn around on the same tape if we were tapings and work with Von Erickson. Their heat was back, but everybody was a baby face with devastation. You know, we had some tough looking guys, and uh, you know the way Akbar always operated it was like uh, a very serious nature and i took this business serious and that's why i maintain he even till this day well so. <laughs> I, uh, skander i've spoken with a lot of people buck robley killer carl cox yeah many others and they all say that it's underestimated the amount of heat that skandor akbar had in texas and in mid-south the fans genuinely a- as a character hated you absolutely how absolutely did you, and, and how'd you get that over well uh like i said just 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 maintaining the character and uh of course you know being of middle eastern descent you know it's kind of like a genuine character and and the thing is uh they've blamed me for everything that's happened in the middle east for the last 50 years i guess but you know it the, the timing was right everything was right but i always maintained that seriousness when i would leave the arena under uh, uh security with my boys i never cursed back i never i ignored them and that made uh, everybody just uh, is they were all all uh, uh, it it would it was really uh, upsetting and uh, uh, and in those days the last days of the you know the sportatorium they would mob out there till twelve thirty or one well after the matches would uh, were ended and uh, the security would have to take us out and and and, and as as I said before it was a tremendous package with myself and the and and the, the birds but uh, I always had that tremendous uh, heat you know and and going back. And, uh, of course, over in Mid-South, we were on world class, I know. And, uh, you know, I had to wear a bulletproof vest in New Orleans at one time. We'll get into that sometime. Sk- but, Skandor, yes, sir. you were unpopular with the fans, but behind the scenes, everyone says that they loved you. Well... <laughs> I always tried to get along. Gary, I uh, there wasn't a territory that I never worked 
that I couldn't go back to. And uh, even the early days, you know, uh, in the early days, I, you know, I was, uh, uh, you know, bigger than usual. And, and uh, you know, I was uh, not only a good uh, wrestler, I was a power lifter. And, hey, uh, I used to go out when I went to experience, got experience in my early days, you know, I would have to uh, slide over somebody who wasn't in shape and everything. But you know what? I did all that. And, uh, but I could always go back and they'd say, anytime you're ready, if you want to come in, come on in. So it was a good feeling, but I worked hard and I realized that one of the main streams of this business was learning how to interview and talk. And I practiced that by myself for a long time. And when I got the opportunity to do it, that has uh, given me great longevity in this business. Uh, you know, my interviews. Yes. Now, I want to ask you about Fritz Van Eric. I've spoken with a lot of people about Fritz. Yeah. You had a lot of access to Fritz. He, he really cared for you. Yes, he did. Tell yes, me, did. B- before things started to happen to the boys, what was Fritz like? Uh... Actually, uh, as time went by, when things were going good, uh, Fritz would only come around the office maybe once or twice a week, maybe once a week. But uh, uh, at that time, I could see that he really wanted to kind of slide out and give the business to the boys. Well, you had some factors there. You had David Von Erich, who had a good mind, and he was probably the only one that had left Dallas for a year and worked down in Florida. And uh, David was probably mechanically uh the best guy in that ring of the of the boys now the, they were all great athletes uh mike never wanted the business that much uh but uh, uh kevin and Kerry were, were were magnificent athletes but david david was the guy and uh and and i think fritz really wanted to get out about that time did, but, he, did uh, he tell you that yeah in so many words you know and you know he'd, he'd always kid around well oh, i'm tired you know he had that voice and everything, and he said it's about time to turn the reins over. He had made that statement several times. But Skandor, he had he had worked in Texas for a long time. It was a good promotion, not not a great promotion as far as you know what had happened to world class. Was he excited about world class growing, or did he want it, like you said, to grow through the kid? Well, I think it was growing growing through the kids, and, and uh, I think he realized times were going to change somewhat. But uh, he wanted to solidify a powerful organization, and when they came up with this world class uh, he wanted to break away from uh, the NWA. Well, you know, he was a charter member at that, uh, that time, but NWA has started to slide about that time. You know, um, uh, Ganya had his own deal, and New York had their deal, so they wanted a W, uh, uh, world-class heavyweight champion. And, uh, of course, they still used NWA, you know, the, the deal with race. Uh, I'm sorry, with Flair and, and, uh, and uh, some of the boys, but I think he wanted world-class and the creation to uh, substantiate power and to uh, to really to build uh, something that uh, people will remember. And my goodness, they have. Now, I, I interviewed uh, Mark Lawrence. Yeah. And Mark came up with something that I, I really hadn't heard before, and that was that if David had lived, if he hadn't died in Japan, that the wrestling uh, landscape today would be very, very different. And what Mark was saying was that David would have taken over the promotion and moved it to places that Fritz just wasn't willing to. Did did you know about that at the time? Yes, I did, and I thoroughly agree with Mark. Uh, most everybody that was there behind the scenes or even uh, working in world class at that time, uh, they will all tell you the same thing. You know, I said earlier about David. He was the man, and uh, he wanted the office. I mean, uh, uh, that was the plans before the untimely death. And uh, later on, Fritz had uh, approached Kevin Connell. Kevin never wanted. I, I don't know what where he was coming from or anything like that, but you know, I would always hear people say, my God, I'd give my right arm to be one of those guys to take this territory over. That's when things were great. And it was a huge bubble, you know, and, and uh, I remember the, the old timers all told me when I came to the business, you know, it's a big bubble, don't burst it. Things can happen, but you know, in the later days when the slide came, well, uh, even the Von Erich name didn't mean that much. It does mean that much, but you know, you have to be, you have to offer for the people something else also uh, even concerning those guys well uh, I didn't want to get off of that but yes I believe if David had lived things would have been tremendously different tremendously uh, what con- was the reaction of Fritz after the death of David not obviously heartbroken to, you know distraught but could you see something else evolving like hey who's going to take this thing over for me yes 
I think so. I think he was searching then, and uh, uh, he's surrounded by good minds and everything. But when David died, he wanted somebody to, uh, you know, they wanted another Von Erich. So uh, Mike, this is where Mike came along. You know, he favored David a little bit more than he did the other boys. And uh, Mike really didn't want this business. And uh, his first match, I volunteered to get to get back in the ring on that. And you know, it's on that faded glory that uh, floating around the country that uh, they did on the on the fan. Family. And uh, he was very, very comfortable with this. And uh, but you know, he told me, he said, you know, he said, you know, Aggie Akbar, they always call me Aggie. He said, I really didn't want this. He was a musician. That was his first love in life. But I think that Jack uh, Fritz uh, just uh, uh, just put that pressure. And of course, uh, you know what kind of ending that had. But yeah, I saw a little change after that, and I really thought that uh, you know, Fritz. Uh, that's when I really, really, I think he really wanted to get out. Uh, uh, but you know, it was it was something that uh, you know, and they they uh, and Andre the Giant loved to come there, and uh, it was a great territory. Everybody was making money, and. Uh of course, uh, we had different packages. You know, we mentioned the boys. Hey, Chino Hernandez was in there. Chris Adams was in there. Uh, like I said, Iceman King Parsons and my guys. And uh, Jimmy Garvin, you know, he was kind of like one of the three birds and stuff like that. So we had a package that the people just loved. And I'm and I'm sure that uh, Fritz believed in his own mind that this thing could go on. He said, but I want to kind of turn it over. And, you know, he wanted the boys to have it. Now, I've heard Gary Hart before his passing say many times that he tried to convince Fritz to take the promotion national because of course if you went into other big cities you could draw huge houses a lot of money would come into the company and then you could buy, get more talent and things would start to evolve do, that, do you yes. do you remember Gary talking to Fritz and yeah I knew of that I knew of that you know while we're on the subject of Gary I'd like to add in March of uh, last year we went to Allentown Pennsylvania he and I and Bill Irwin were the only ones there for a signing uh and uh, mid south, and on the way back, uh, uh, Gary and I rode back together. And uh, of course, uh, we live in this area, and we said goodbye. And he passed away eight hours earlier. I couldn't believe it. So uh, Gary had, uh, uh, yes, he did say that, and I'm I'm sure other people did too. Maybe Bronco Lubitsch said that because Andre would come in, and he was being booked by McMahon. You know, the old the the elder Mr. McMahon, who I worked for, and uh, he would say, he said, someday, he said. Uh, you know, you'd go nationally because he said uh, uh, the East Coast is going to do it. Uh, when the elder man dies, the elder McMahon, this man will go nationally. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we this came to be. But uh, you know, I don't, I don't really think Fritz knew anything. I, I heard him make the statement a lot of times. He said nobody will ever be in Dallas but me. Nobody. But uh, did you see Gary confront Fritz on, on this? Or? I did not. Okay. But, you know, Gary, I knew Gary pretty well, you know, and uh, I met Gary first in 1966, and I was swinging around in territories. I was out there in Amarillo when Dory Funk Sr. was running. I went through there for a short time, and Gary was there, and uh, so I knew him, and uh, I knew when he came back here that he had a good deal, but I did know that because he had told me about that. What did he say to you behind the scenes in the in the early 80s? Did he say, I can't get through to Fritz, I can't get through to Fritz? Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. He said he's headstrong and I can't do anything about it. But he wanted, and uh, that, that's what they really wanted to do, is go national. And, of course, then it became a trend, you know, when Crockett bought out Bid South, they went this way and this. And, but uh, I think that... Uh, uh, Fritz really believed that uh, this was his little domain, and it was. It was. You know, at that time, nobody could. And it took opposition. I mean, I'm going to say opposition, but uh, uh, like New York, it took them a long time to crack Dallas, you know, and, and also in Louisiana. But getting back to Fritz, he was headstrong about that. He did not, and he did bang that fist. He said, nobody's going to run Dallas with me in that voice. And uh, so he believed that. He believed that. Unfortunately, with David gone, I don't think uh, that uh, Kevin had it in his mind and Kerry didn't and uh, Mike surely didn't. So then the domino effect became uh, uh, predominant with the boys. Skandor, what did you think at the time? Well, I thought, 
I could feel the business would change. Now, see, uh, Gary, I got in a long time ago when nobody stepped on anybody's toes. In other words, an example, uh, the book and I, you know, the two offices in Amarillo, Amarillo would not run close to Dallas, and Dallas would not run close to Lubbock and Amarillo. So everybody uh, around the country had the understanding that there's no opposition, nobody steps on anybody's toes, or uh, so to speak, and uh, and I and that was still going when we got into Dallas at that time, but uh, there was rumors that that was going to change. But, but Skinner, you have to remember, and as I'm sure you do, that Fritz was already in some way stepping on other people's toes because the show was going into the East Coast, it was going in all over the country, and the show that you guys were producing was so far superior to the other local shows That's right. that you guys were already elevating yourself. That's the part of this story I, I haven't been able to really uncover yet, is why Fritz was so willing to syndicate the show, but wouldn't follow it up with something that would make him the money. Well, he had the opportunity. He was on Channel 11, which is an independent, was Gaylord Independent, and it went out through several states, and uh, later on, uh, Fox... uh uh, it became a CBS affiliate, and the, the shares, they uh, Fritz had a 26 shares there at, at times on this Channel 11, which is unheard of, and, uh, uh, you know, I've talked to people over there at CBS affiliate, they've had pro football, pro basketball, everything, and they never even come close to what we did on that Saturday night, but he had that opportunity to get on there, and of course, you know, the, 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 here, here goes the, the Turner Network, too, they had the opportunity also, but but uh, we could go to St. Louis. We could go everywhere that uh, Channel 11 came into. And I'll tell you what, uh, we'd go in those different territories and everything would just balloon. I mean, the sellout was there. For the other promoters. Yes. Yeah, because you guys, they'd see you guys up on the Superstation. They'd see you on the uh, uh, Pat Robertson's network. Then you'd go in and work St. Louis, and St. Louis would get a boost because they, the local fans wanted to come out and see you guys, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that really happened, particularly in St. Louis. And that's another story I'll get into. Uh, like I said, we had a lot of good guys come in, and uh, uh, Chris Adams came. And uh, he was up and down the card a lot, and then Kamala came in, and everybody that that uh, wrestled with Kamala right here in my hometown. Of course, I was in Tulsa that night helping Dibiase uh, turn bad, but they had a spot show. We called spot shows, and uh, when Kamala came in, everybody did a 15 second. You know what? Uh, because he was so tenacious and everything. So Chris Adams had came to the promotion, and uh, he told him, he said, uh, if I had a place to go, I'd leave now. I'm dead. They said it doesn't work that way and Bronco my old the late Bronco Lubitsch who I respected so much told him he said no 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 this is not the end so they had Sunshine here remember Sunshine with Jimmy Garvin she had a lot of heat on her so Jimmy Garvin's wife was coming back to the organization they were just going to uh, dump Sunshine so Ken Mantell came up with the idea and a bunch of guys there Bronco he said why don't we turn her good she's a baby face so they did that over a period of several weeks and it got God over good, but they were wondering who are we going to put with? David's wife was jealous. Carrie's wife was jealous. Uh, it went on and on, Kevin. So they said, how about Chris Adams? And Chris Adams never looked back. They went with Sunshine and Chris uh, against uh, Jimmy Garvin and, uh, and Precious in St. Louis and sold it out true story so you know it just it just goes to show you how powerful everything was now in 1984 vince goes national and fritz finally opens the doors and says okay we're going to go outside the territory and i remember he came into lynn massachusetts were you were you at that show i was not there okay i was still working back and forth in uh 84 and i believe i was in uh over in Mid South. Did you hear anything? Why Fritz? A lot? Well, they they uh, I think they liked uh, what what had happened, but I, you know, I never heard much comment on that. I don't know if uh, uh, really wasn't his cup of tea, but he wanted to do it. Okay. Who was pushing more to go national, Ken Mantell or Gary Hart? I think uh, I think uh, Gary Hart. But now Ken Mantell was in syndicating. We had a syndicator out here at Las Colinas here in Dallas, and uh, he's the one that really started uh, the ball rolling. Ken is the one that started the uh, uh, Superstation and the idea of world class expanding out. 
So uh, we had a syndicator that got those things done. And, uh, of course, it, it was interesting anywhere you went. And uh, there was, uh, but I still think Fritz had his mind. He said, no, I'm just not going to get too far away from Dallas. I'm going to come back. And, uh, uh, like I say, everything was just so lucrative here. It was just it was just unbelievable. But, you know, other places, too. And I think if they'd concentrated more on the outside, uh, that would have helped also. Now, as world class began to unwind, it became obvious that uh, some of the boys, or mo- maybe even most of the boys within the company, had issues with uh, with drugs. Did you? Did you? Kn- you must have known, but did you? Were you worried about that as a concern? Oh yes, yes. Of course, we were all worried about that. And uh, yes, and true, we knew it was going on. Was it hidden abuse, or was it just right there in the dressing room? Uh, well, not so much in the dressing room. But when they came in, you could tell, and, uh, you know, it was running rampant. The business was changing a little bit about that. You know, when I got into the business, the guys might enjoy a little six-pack of beer, but nobody missed a shot, and there was not, uh, there was no weed or drugs or narcotics or anything like that. And, uh, you know, it became a primary concern. It became a big concern, and that's when the boys started missing shots. And... Uh, so, Skandor, you're you're in the dressing room. You're old school. You don't miss shot. No, and, no. And and you you're waiting for them to come through the door, and they don't. What it, what? Now you're not the kind of guy to be outspoken. But what are you thinking? This this is just not good. No, no, no. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. You know. And and if if I was confronted with it or something, I would uh, uh, more or less uh, you know offer something and. Uh, but I, I, I could see it slipping away. And uh, a lot of places, now Dallas did not institute this, would fine guys for being late. But, uh, you know, maybe they should have. Because, you know, there's nothing, and I've done some private promotions too, there's nothing that gives somebody an ulcerated stomach wound uh, as to the fact that somebody's going to, uh, you know, the show and uh, the substitutions hurt you more in wrestling than anything in the world. And they still do on these little independents. Sometimes, you know, if they want to see somebody, they want to see them. So uh, I don't I don't want to talk Mid-South, but I will I will make this comment. And that is that a lot of people have been critical for about Bill Watts for the way he ran things behind the scenes. Bill Watts wouldn't have stood for the Von Erich's uh, no shows. No, 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 no. See, they think Bill was a tyrant. But let me tell you, uh, Bill did what he had to do because he saw the changes coming, too. And uh, missing shots and and he find them all no matter who. And, uh, you know, it kind of got their attention kind of got their attention but uh, here it wasn't and it should have been it, it should have been but uh, unfortunately it wasn't now we brought the von erics up to mid-south too a lot and, and i'll get into that a little later on but uh uh you know bill uh he wasn't a tyrant at all i mean he, he ran the business the way that uh he should have at that point in time but in getting back to uh, uh the national deal uh, it was uh when we started going and, and the and the ratings were just tremendous here they were just they were just out of sight and everywhere that the uh that we had gone and everything you could go in there and of course sell out but I, Fritz just never followed up on the uh on the shows outside of Dallas that much. Talk to me a little bit about the Sportatorium. As a as a TV watcher back then, it looked like this beautiful building, but everyone I've spoken with has said that it was not only not beautiful, but all, all, virtual, almost dangerous. Well, it was. As time went by, it was out of code. Now, they may have here what they call grandfather claws. Example, if you have an old garage that's kind of messed up and on uh, closer to somebody else's property, if it was built before 1950 or something, they can't do anything about it. Well, the Sportatorium was leased. Now, Fritz did not own the Sportatorium. Contrary to a lot of belief, he did. It was uh, the, the refrigeration company, Mr. Alford, in the later days that owned it, even when Ed McLemore was there. And they leased it. And the wiring, the plumbing was atrocious, but nobody said anything. And then when we started selling out, the fire marshals and Fritz knew each other, and uh, they let us get by with a lot of uh, things. But uh, it got to the point where it was so many people that the fire marshal had to stop in. But, uh, uh, you know, the code on that building, and after this all came about, and people in the 90s wanted to do the sportatorium, and it would take like uh, all for over a quarter of a million to even recode it. They would have to dig 
dig up all that plumbing and everything. So, you know, consequently, uh, the later uh, landlords had torn it down. And a lot of us had uh, the Sportatorium. We uh, we, we wanted the uh, Dallas people to do make a historical marker. Now, see, they could have made a museum because of the, the uh, not only the great wrestling, but Elvis Presley, more or less. You know, he had, he, would, he, he didn't start here, but, I mean, he was just a punk kid that had to find a drummer around town to back up his band. And they had the big D Jamboree, had all these people. And, you know, it could have paid for itself. But uh, Dallas is funny. If it had been a library, I guess they'd done it. But the Sportatorium, when uh, I was in a lot of countries, of course, you know, and when you go through there and your passport, Dallas, you know, they knew about the Sportatorium. It was worldwide. And I'll say this, anybody that's been anything in this business, most all have walked through those portals. They walked through those doors at the Sportatorium. Gandor, as things started to uh, disintegrate, yes. Um, wh- what was the attitude like in the locker room? Uh, obviously, Fritz had lightning in the bottle with World Class, the Freebirds, the Von Erichs, Chris Adams, Devastation Incorporated. Yes. And now it's starting to slip away. And when things start to slip away, very difficult to recover. Yes. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. No matter how many times and how popular you are and how over, so to speak, the thing about it is people eventually become despondent about it. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, they love those kids, the franchise. They love what was going on. But, you know, you, you, you it's almost like uh, the old proverbial thing where you ride the horse to the cliff, but it won't go over. But those things begin to happen, like 85, 86. Things were still good, but uh, the people... You know, we're beginning to uh, absorb the rumors about the kids and the drugs and what was going on. And then the death of Gino Hernandez. Very bad. Very, yes, b- yeah, very yeah. bad, yeah. Yes, yes. And, uh, uh, you know, that was... I think uh, people focus on the Von Erich death. Yeah. But Gino had just had that successful program with Chris as a partner against the Von Erichs. They uh, 30,000, 35,000 people in the Cotton Bowl. Mm-hmm. The promotion was still still hanging in there. Gino dies and people start to look at this and say, whoa. Oh, wait a minute. That's true. It was tragic about Gino and uh, all the boys. But if you look back, and you know, some people, uh, uh, I, I had an interview not long ago, and this guy said, what about the Sportatorium curse? And I said, what do you mean? I, and then, of course, he named off, uh, done a lot of research on this, so many in the, the modern era that have died that worked in the Sportatorium. It was uncanny. I couldn't believe. And when you start saying that, you know, the Von Erich, you got Gino, even Rick Rude worked here. He died up. Just uh, uh, Brody was here. He's gone. I mean, it was like 16 or 18 guys. And, you know, that's unheard of. Uh, but uh, Well, you, you make a good point in that, you know, drugs and wrestling, are um, they, they go together in modern day, even today. But oh, people, my goodness, yeah. But, but people focus on the drugs in world class, and some people might not believe in a jinx, but others might. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's kind of like, uh, uh, hold on just one minute. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I just switched around here just yeah, a little no while. But uh, it, it's it's what what it is. It's it's uh, 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 I know it goes on now. We had dress codes, and, and even the big organizations they come in the dressing room with flip flops and uh, what have you and stuff like that, and and uh, tank tops and stuff like that. And it's kind of like. Uh, uh, they look like they come out of the gym, you know. Are we getting a bleed over? I wasn't going to say anything, but we are getting a bleed over. It can't be oh, from me. Uh, it's got to be on your end. It has, yeah. Hold on. Let me get back on this little one here. Okay. Now, if this cuts off, uh, it'll be all right. Okay, so don't I'll worry get about back. It. Yep. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. Hold on. Go ahead. Boy. Titan. Ah, there you go. Okay, are. we got it? Yeah, that's better. No bleed over. Okay, you hear me better? Yeah, I can hear you good. Hello. Scandor? Hello. Hello, I'm here. You're faint. Hello. Yeah, now we're black to back to bleed over. Okay, I'm sorry. Are you okay now? Now I'll, I'll hang this one up here. Okay. Oh, okay, that's what's doing. Okay, got it. I'll, I'll, I'll edit this out. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. Uh, let me, oh, three, two, one. Uh huh. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, uh, we were on the subject about the changes, and uh, uh, it did have a diverse effect. And later on, when uh, the Sportatorium had uh, started the big slide and everything, and I guess the kids were, uh, you know, after everything happened with the kids and everything, I think it was like uh, uh, Fritz wanted out, and he finally eventually did. 
and they sold Ken Mantell. Scandal, were you around when the crowds were slipping, or did you take off to Mid South? No, I went. Uh, I went back to Mid South in those days, and uh, of course now I uh, I would come in for the big shows. I came in for Texas Stadium, the Cotton Bowl, and I worked several of those. I I never really out there was one Texas Stadium that I missed. Were you there when the Texas Stadium was virtually empty in the eighty? I think it was eighty seven. Yeah, I was one. I was one of the last ones, incidentally. What's that like in a huge stadium like that with only six or seven thousand fans? What does it feel strange, or it's no difference, or well. Do you remember? Yeah, there is a difference. There is a difference, but uh, when you're out there, you just concentrate on what's going on. But, you know, we did the Cotton Bowl down here, and then we did Fort Worth, Tarrant County Convention Center, the big ones, and uh, they all begin to go by the wayside. They surely did. Did Fritz ever come in and, you know, I've heard he took his fist and smashed on the table, and we're going to clean this thing up, or you didn't see that? Never saw it again. Never saw it again. I think he was just trying to pass the reins on, and... Uh, there was nobody to pass him on to no no but he had good people in the office bronco was there and uh uh there were several people did you know anything about Kerry's accident as far as there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes obviously he got in the, the motorcycle accident did you did you have any insight into that at the time well i got it from a reliable source about the accident he had the accident but uh he tried to uh uh, when he was supposed to be resting the accident, he was uh, resting. He he uh, he re-injured it on the motorcycle, and contrary to, to the belief, you know, the uh, entire ankle was not amputated. There was a uh, like a stump there, and I was one of the very few to see it. You know, he'd always cover it up and never shower or anything like that. So uh, the, you now know, Kerry was a proud guy. It must have he was a proud guy. You know, Gary he kept on, and he became addicted to uh, pain pills. But you know what? That was the only way he could go. That, and I've talked to other people that were amputees, and they and they uh, chose to amputate the leg because when there's something like that that happens, then the excruciating pain becomes so unbearable, and that's what really happened to Kerry. Yeah. And the loss of his family, as far as uh, divorce-wise, the two little beautiful little jo- children that he has, I think it just kind of took its toll on. And I will tell you another thing about Fritz too. He had been out of the business for a while. Uh, well, he had stayed home, and uh, when Kerry did this thing, uh, he had called me that day, and it was in February, and I told him, I said, uh, why don't you come down to this auditorium? I'd love, you know, and he said, well, okay, I'll get that claw on you. Yeah, he always does that. And uh, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Bronco Lubitsch calls and says, you're not going to believe this. He said, Kerry killed himself. And I said, I just got through talking to Fritz. I hadn't talked to him since Christmas. What's going on? He said, well, it happened, and we were devastated. And at that time, a different promotion had taken over, but Kerry had come back and worked with us and there was a local lawyer here in town that had got into the mid-south deal and uh, uh i'm sorry the uh, world class and uh we were doing all right we did a little deal for Kerry, but in the last days Kerry came back and uh, uh he and i became closer and uh we were doing the uh more or less the manipulation and everything here and he fit in so good again and he was i, I think he had aspirations of going back to his marriage but i do not think that uh that would ever transfer as a matter of fact, as, as, as it goes, saying that he met with her that day and she declined, you know, the reconciliation. So uh, he goes to uh, Fritz's. And the way Fritz told told me that uh, he just uh, he went out to the pasture when he didn't come back he knew what had happened so you know though that's uh, that's a uh, it's a very tragic thing and uh, I really think that you just put the cap on Chris and I think uh, I'm sorry on Fritz because you know Fritz died in '97 and I think uh, he was either '93 or '94 when Carrie passed then you know Fritz and Doris divorced and everything and did you ever speak with Fritz at length after that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. What was he? I've read his autobiography, and he he started to become have questions about the existence of God. As you know, losing all those sons, it's not hard to understand. Uh, what was what was his what was his mindset at that? I would that just devastating to lose those boys. Well, this lawyer that uh, uh, was in the sportatorium with my you know with us, and we went out to visit him, and before we did the Kerry tribute to make sure everything was all right, and he agreed. He came down there for the tribute and everything. So. Uh, we wanted to make sure and get everything right. And he dwelled on it and everything. And uh, he said, this will be the last hurrah, the last anybody will ever see me. He said, but I will come out there for the carry tribute. So he was very despondent. You know, I had never seen him like that. I mean, he would always had that, that uh, this uh, 
uh, powerful, uh, you know, this uh, tenacity he always had and everything. But Fritz was almost subdued when I saw him that last time. And I spoke to him about a week or two before he died. He was up at Baylor. It was... Uh, Obviously, he had a lot of regret. Yes, he did. And maybe some confusion because sometimes, you know, you can you can control yourself to some extent, but everybody's got a free will. And you know. Well, it's like why. You know, that's a three-letter word, but, you know, when people get a terminal disease, they'll say, why me? Well, Fritz Fathcraft, you know, why me, the boys? And how many American families do we know about that lost as many people as that family lost, as many people that, are, that reside in this country? You know, it's hard to... It's it's really hard to fathom because uh, it just doesn't happen every day, and it really tore him down. Yeah, he was really subdued when I when I talked to him, when I saw him, and then talked to him on the phone. How do you how do you explain Kevin making it through all this? Because Kevin must have had issues as well, and just escaped. It's it, they really should almost make a movie about it. It's well, they start. I believe that it was in the works, but uh, Kevin got away. And uh, uh, about uh, a couple of three years ago, I got Kerry, uh, uh, Kevin to come up to Paris, Texas, to make a little appearance. But he was strictly against that. He was strictly against that. Uh, but he did it, and uh, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't like to be around the arena. And Pam, Pam doesn't want it either. Is why because you know Kevin gets down a lot about that. Yeah. And they live over in Hawaii now and everything. And I talked to him not long ago, but. Uh, no, no, he does not. He he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to do that. Very difficult. Yes. Ken Mantel comes into Texas, uh, 1987, 88. He had been running a Wild West, Wild West rest. Yes, uh-huh. And World Class has a little bit of a re- revitalization. Michael Hayes is back in, uh, Iceman. It, it's starting to look good, but the crowd's still not there, right? No. When that happened, uh, I went back to Mid-South, which became UWF for a short time. And uh, I talked to Ken about it, but I figured uh, the best thing for me to go, and I said, well, I will come back uh, at a later date. But uh, uh, Kenny had that Wild West Wrestling, and he was successful in syndicating that out for a while. But it just just wasn't the same, you know. Uh, you know, when you look for the encore, it just wasn't the same uh, as the days. I don't think they ever recaptured that. Never, never. And then something even more interesting happens in that in that Jerry Jarrett purchases a uh, world class from Fritz. Or now I worked with Jerry Jarrett down there finally. And again, a revitalization. And again, it leads to the death, which I never quite understood why it it died. But talk well, a little bit about Jarrett in Texas. Well, when Jarrett got in, he got got in and paid back stuff that they owed Channel 11 after Fritz got in. The kids were still uh, somewhat partners. Jerry Jarrett got in the uh, the sportatorium, and uh, he, I met with him and everything. We worked with him, and uh, we started drawing some good crowds, but it was a Band-Aid operation financially and everything like that. You know, Jerry, uh, you know, he, he always watched his dollars, I guess, like everybody else. But uh, I had a kid here named Eric Embry that helped out a lot, and uh, we did a deal with Eric Embry that uh, everybody said couldn't be done. We turned him baby face. Now, he had the uh, gay gimmick and the uh, sourdough body and everything like that, and they said, you never can do it. So we went out and devastation, and we made a big, big, and I'm telling you, big baby face out of that guy, and he started getting letters again. It was almost like revitalizing world world class. He started getting the letters, and the postman was always saying, my God, there's as many letters as we've got in a long time. But you could do anything with television. You could do anything with TV. We still had TV then. You had to remember that, you know, Channel 11. Didn't, didn't Jarrett have an ability of taking somebody who almost didn't belong in the ring at all uh, and making them a usable main eventer? More or less he did. Yes, more or less he did. Uh, uh, the one thing I can say about Jerry Jarrett, I admire him because his son did not start out on top. You, you know, he paid a few dues over there before that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, he started to spotlight Jeff. But uh, eventually... Jerry became despondent, and there was a lawsuit involved, too. Uh, Kevin's lawyers, uh, they started to intervene because uh, evidently uh, uh, some way that Jared had made a mistake. I don't know the details on that, but that's when Jerry started to fade away, and when he got out, then... uh, Several other promotions you, tried to take it. Excuse and, uh, me, Scandal. Yeah. Were you there as he was going out? Yes, yes. What? Well, because I, I I used to watch uh, on Saturday night's Channel Eleven. It was a broadcast all over the country on satellite and cable. Mm-hmm. And USWA, which World Class evolved into, it there was interest at the Sportatorium, and then it just kind of vanished, and it happened quickly. What was going on behind the scenes? 
Well, uh, you know, he was uh, he had put a lot of effort in it, not a lot of money, but effort. And, uh, uh, you know, you need to change out talent just a little bit, too. So that was an issue there that uh, he didn't want it to. And he still had Memphis or whatever. And uh, then after uh, this thing happened with Kerry, the Embry and everything, then the people started. It wasn't drawing like it used to. And so he wanted to get out. Was, was Jarrett notorious in the locker room for underpaying the guys? Oh, uh, gosh, yeah, some, some, yeah, somewhat, yeah. yeah because Mark Lawrence said that the reason he finally left yeah. was because Jarrett just told him, we're slashing your pay in half, uh-huh. and Mark didn't want any part of it, and he left, and Mark was a very important part of the yeah. presentation at the time. Mm-hmm. So and and a lot of people said that about Jarrett, which you know a, a good businessman is going to try and uh, keep a bottom line and make a profit. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. right, right, right. Well, those things happened, you know, and then uh, there and were it, some revival attempts after Jarrett left. Yeah, um, there was a small outfit. I uh, Grizzly Smith and I helped him out a little bit, and they call himself Confederate Wrestling Association and Association for a while with a little money in it, but not not big. So you know those things uh, didn't didn't work out and everything the way they. Should. Should have. What's the one moment, Skander, you look back at and say, aside from the death of David, th- this is where we lost it? Do in, what? In Texas. This is where the thing, the fans, we lost our connection with the fans, aside from David's death. Well, more or less. They were still with us when uh, David's death. Uh, you know, it, was, it, it did lead to the trail of demise. It really did. Do you think it was a booking problem or the out-of-the-ring problem? I think it was out-of-the-ring problem. I really do. Yeah. I really do because people begin to, to uh, you know, they, they started to uh, grasp that. They really did. Do you, do you miss Skandor? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I love the business, and I wouldn't trade any moment for it, you know, and I was an intricate part of a lot of things. Do you look back at world class like Gary Hart and say, you know, I, I really wish these guys had had their act together because I would have had a, a much longer run within the company. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. And believe me, and I'll say this right now, that after world class, all the attempts were made, and that, was, that included Jarrett and the other people, never had an encore. Because what do you do for an encore when you had those tremendous years? What do you do? I mean, what can you do? So it was there. It, it was gone. And, you know, that bubble burst, like I had mentioned before, and that's it. It's, it's, it's gone. It's like a page torn out. But I'll say it again. They've reached epic proportions with that. With that. It, it was unbelievable how popular that it was and wherever we went. Were there, I, were, were there points where you, when you were at ringside and you looked out and you saw the people and you, I just can't believe this, during the glory days? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or or did you get caught up in it? it well, I really, you know, it was it was I knew that uh, that uh, things were good, you know, because I'd been around the business a long time, mm. and uh, you know, I could feel it. You know, you can feel when things are, are everything is everything is getting over. You can feel that. So it, it was it was a, an experience that. Uh, that I really, really, I am so thankful that I was part of, and uh, I loved every bit of it. And, you know, as far as the family, uh, Fritz, Jack, and his family and everything, uh, they were just, uh, they'll always be in my, the best memories. And, you know, when the funerals came around, I couldn't go. I had so much heat. There was no way, but I offered my condolences to the family, you know, privately. But uh, there was no way. There was no way I could go. And neither could the uh, birds. I don't think they ever went either, you know. But uh, it was... A an experience that uh, you know, I, I had I had a friend of mine retired from a bank over here in Third. Oh, yes. Yeah, are you there? Yeah. And he said it was so uneventful. And I said, well, sir, I wouldn't take one week's bad bookings for all that 30 years you had in that bank. <laughs> so it was great. It was great. Okay. Uh, there's a KRLD tower that's out here, you know, and it bleeds over sometime in this back over here. <laughs> but I'm okay. You know, if you want to go on, we can go on. And I'd love to do the Mid-South, whenever. Oh, you, you like the interview? I loved it. Okay, I'm going to, here's what, we're going to close this up because we're going to do an hour and then we'll, don't hang up on me though, okay? I wanna, okay, we're going to close up this one for now, we're right? We're going to close this one, and, but don't hang up. I'm going to say thank you nice and blah, 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 but you don't hang up because I still want to talk to you a second. Okay? Surely. Three, uh-huh. two, one. Skander, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time with us today, the secrets, the behind the scenes happenings at World Class, and you were a great part of it. I really enjoyed the way you handled yourself inside the ring and as the manager, the creator of Devastation Incorporated. Well, I certainly appreciate that, Gary, and you know, it was it was my, it was so fortunate for me to be part of it, and, and uh, 
uh, it was it was an era in wrestling and professional wrestling the way it was, and it was uh, it was something that people remembered it's etched in their mind. How many people, as I said before earlier, that would stop me on the street and ask me about uh, world class wrestling? They just you know it's it's they just loved it. They they loved every minute of it, and I loved every minute all also. And it's always been a pleasure for me to talk about it because, you know, you love to talk about good things that happen in your life. Everybody's like that. And that was one of the high points, the high points of Skandor Akbar's career. And like I say, it spanned from 1961 on up to private. Skandor, thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you.